Alrighty, well, good morning, everybody. It is great to have each and every one of you here today. Welcome to those that are visiting, those that call Asbury home, and those that are watching online. It is a beautiful day out there, and the Lord is good. Uh, quick announcement for today. We have the men's breakfast coming up uh, on this Saturday. So if any of you were are used to the original or the old schedule of the last Saturday and you showed up last week or yesterday, there was no breakfast. It's next week. The reason being is that we have a guest speaker coming. I'm going to butcher the name, but uh, we'll call him uh, Richard Humberto. And I'm not even going to try with the last name. Uh, and he's from Cuba, and he's going to be coming to share with you guys. So uh, you're going to get a, a, a great challenge and a message from him, as well as an amazing breakfast, as always, from the guys in the kitchen. So uh, this uh, upcoming uh, Saturday at 8 a.m. here in the, in the uh, fellowship hall. Uh, those are all the announcements. Oh, I have one announcement. Sorry. Uh, it is somebody's birthday today. I'm not going to tell you whose birthday it is. You'll have to figure it out, but it is somebody's birthday today. Who's going now? Jeff is up. There you go, Jeff. <laughs> What's that? Sharon's telling me it's tomorrow. Okay, I'm up. Uh, Lord, uh, we are gathered in your presence, and we are expecting to hear from you this morning, Lord, because you are good, you're holy, you're available, and you are speaking. So this morning, Father, we invite your presence to be among us. May your fingerprints be felt on every part of, our, uh, of us as a congregation and, and as individuals, body, soul, and spirit. Meet with us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 34, 34, verse 3. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let's stand for our first hymn, first song. You, you were, were the, the word at the beginning.
sing for thee is the Lamb who was slain. And on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice a thousand generations sing for thee is the Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our children. Father, we thank you for um, their joy, their excitement, Father. Lord, we just pray this morning as they head downstairs to continue learning more and more about you, Father, that, Lord, that they will um, just take in all that their Sunday school teacher is teaching them today. Lord, I pray that you'll bless the teachers, bless the children, and you just be with them this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.
So I'm going to ask if you would come and just stand by the people who are at the altar this morning. If just somebody stand with each person, put your hand on their shoulder and touch them as we pray this morning. Just come forward, okay, everybody. Because God is in the business of touching us. And if there are people who need prayer this morning who don't want to come to the altar, just raise your hand especially for you. Father, you are in our midst and you are holy. We are standing in your presence, Lord, or we are kneeling in your presence. And so, Father, we pray that as we for we lift up our mic's not working very well. That you would meet with us in a special place. Father, there are people here this morning who need a touch of healing in their bodies. And that's what you did, Lord. You invited people to touch you, and you touched people. Would you meet those physical needs right now? Not because of anything we've done, Lord, but because you are holy, and you are here, and you are touching. And Father, I pray if people need means this morning, opportunity, you would open doors for them. You would make a way for them, Lord. You're in the business of opening doors and making a way. Father, meet each person here this morning. Our hearts are open to you. We are standing in your presence. We are waiting for a touch and a word from your throne. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You're the one 
this song as a hard song to sing sitting down. If you're able to stand, we ask that you stand. If you're not able to, that is fine as well. singing. <laughs> One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here am I, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord said. The Lord, take your sandals, take them off, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, 
I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is the land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered and said, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Good job on the parasites and Jebusites. <laughs> Good job on that, man. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I want to welcome any guests who are here today. It's great to see you. Uh, um, that fabulous passage of scripture from the book of Exodus, there are several passages in the New Testament that refer to that passage of Moses and the events that Dennis just read to us. So, for example, in the book of Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was making his testimony before the chief priests, this is what Stephen said to the people. In verse 23, Moses was 40 years old. He fled Egypt. He was 40 years old when he fled Egypt. And 40 years later, an angel appeared to him in a burning bush. So in our narrative today, Moses is 80 years old. But there is a backstory, of course. And the backstory starts 80 years earlier. You remember the events? The Pharaoh of Egypt did not recognize the history of the people of Israel coming to Egypt. And it said in, in Exodus 2, 8, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. He was threatened by the Jewish increase, the multi they were multiplying, and he determined to kill newborn male children to stop it. It says in Exodus 2.15 that the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the, the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. The backstory to this starts with two midwives who defy the rule of Pharaoh. Isn't that something? This is 80 years before Moses is out in the wilderness. And his mother, in an attempt to save his life after hiding him for three months, puts him in a basket on the Nile. The word for basket there is tiva, and that is the word, same word that we use for Noah's ark. Okay. He was put in an ark on the Nile River. That is significant. Okay. Noah saved his people. Moses will save his people. And Pharaoh's daughter adopts him and raises her as her own son. And then in Acts chapter 7, uh, Again, verse 22, if that's up. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech and action. So Moses was a, was a man who was, who was extremely gifted. Okay? When it says he, he was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, okay, just think about what that might mean. When Moses saw his people suffering under the oppression of the Egyptians, well, he killed an Egyptian and he buried him. 
And then when a couple of Egyptian men were, or Hebrew men were arguing the next day, and he tried to break it up, they said to Moses, who are you to break up our fight? Are you going to kill us too? And he realized his gig was up, and he fled. Okay? He left the courts of Pharaoh. These courts were opulent beyond our understanding. It was the most advanced technology, a rich tapestry of culture and learning, and it included reading and writing and math. Would you pull up the next picture, please, if that's possible? Yeah. So uh, uh, Sharon and I were at the Getty Villa Museum in, uh, in California, and there was an ancient Egypt uh, display on loan from the British Museum. It was phenomenal to see. And it was, it, this was part of what Moses left, okay? Moses left the height of technology and, and culture. And he was taught all that wisdom when he left. He was 40 when he left, and in Exodus it says that Israel had dwelt in Egypt for 430 years. A few generations have gone by. Now, you know when someone lives in another culture for a period of time, they get assimilated into that culture. They learn a lot from that culture. Moses was no different. When I looked into this, I found that even the book of Exodus, which is attributed to Moses, he wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that's the capacity this guy had. He used almost 400 words that have their origin in the Egyptian language. This guy was wise and in the Egyptian language. And later when they, when they built the tabernacle in the desert, when, they, when the Israelites left, it says that skilled craftsmen constructed it. Well, where did they learn their craft? They learned it in Egypt when they were building stuff for the Pharaoh. So Moses is carrying this immense learning and culture with him, along with his own family heritage and rumors of Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Moses. He's carrying his own culture with him, and he's fleeing for his life, and he goes 700 kilometers into the desert of Midian. And Midian, the Midianites were, were polytheists. They worshipped many gods. And in that culture and in that place, at around 40 years of age, Moses takes a wife. He takes the, the, the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian. He has two children. And he lives the next 40 years on that mountain, in that area, shepherding sheep. This guy with this immense background, all this learning. And one day in the midst of that daily grind of shepherding sheep on the backside of a mountain, Moses encounters a burning bush. And it got his attention. It says that Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. Okay. It's unusual, but he didn't fall on his face. It's like, well, oh, what is that? I think we can go over and, and find out what that is. And God says to him, don't come any closer. You are standing on holy ground. Remove your sandals from your feet. You're standing on holy ground. The presence of God was there. In the wilderness of Midian, in a polytheistic religious culture, okay, you might say similar to Canada right now, okay, the power and the presence of God was there. And God says, don't come any closer. Remove your sandals from your feet. I'm going to come back to that a little, a little later, that directive, remove your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. Well, was the soil that, that 
Moses was standing on, was that somehow special soil? No. The presence of the Lord is what made the ground holy. The presence of the Lord is what makes Mount Sinai holy. So what has been holy ground in your life? Where have you walked on holy ground? On a bus? In your garden? Driving your car? In a classroom? In a kitchen? Holding your child or grandchild? Well, you could say God is omniscient. He's everywhere. And that makes everywhere holy ground. And you know, that would be true. God's power is ever-present. It's sustaining and it's governing all things. And in that sense, it's holy. And you could also say, uh, along with the children, uh, who are the disciples that Jesus, he's, Jesus said, I, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And that's true as well. But the ground we're talking and we're seeing about here is the manifest presence of God in a place and for a purpose. And Moses saw it and he felt it and he heard God speak. The Old Testament sometimes holiness and the presence of God is represented by a fire, sometimes by a cloud. But friends, where the presence of the Lord is, it's holy ground. Now, I know and you know that there are times in our life when we do not feel the presence of God. And there may be some reasons for that. It may be because we have chosen a path of rebellion against God. We neglect God. We are mutinous towards God. And we basically feel the consequences of that we do not feel the presence of God. But we're told to seek the Lord continually in Psalm 104. Why would we have to seek the Lord continually? Because if we don't, if we neglect God, we, ne we neglect his presence in our lives. There may be times in our lives when we don't feel the presence of God while we are being faithful, while we are following the, the Lord, and still his presence is hidden from us. And in those times when we cannot feel the presence of God, my experience is that God wants obedience in spite of that. God will say, follow me, follow me, follow me. It's, he, and, he, and he might say, wait. But because we're seeking the Lord, I tell you, it is holy ground, whether or not we feel the presence of God. So every time you resist temptation, you are on holy ground. Every time you are obedient to the word of Christ, you are on holy ground. Every time you forgive someone, you're on holy ground. Every time you call out to him in the night or marvel, at his creation, the intricacies, or are grateful to God for his provision, for his grace, for forgiveness, you're on holy ground. Every time you show hospitality, listen with your heart to what someone is saying. Every time you serve the poor, Jesus says, you're serving me. That's holy ground. You know, I was told on Friday by a lady who had been to teenagers the day before, she felt the kindness of God at teenagers. That is holy ground. Now, my appreciation for holy ground was heightened considerably uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, I got sick and, uh, and I, I lost some capacity. And every night I cried out to God. And every night I felt his presence. It was holy. And you know, since that time, cutting the grass used to be drudgery. It's not drudgery anymore. It's holy ground. And every time Sharon asks me to vacuum the bedrooms, 
Well, there are some exceptions. Okay. <laughs> and take it back to Moses. Moses was in the wilderness. He was tending sheep in a faraway country, away from his people, away from the opulent life he had led. And his time is getting shorter, considering the first 40 years of his life and the next 40. He must have thought, what am I doing here? But in those days of shepherding sheep, in those days of silence in the wilderness of Midian, God was orchestrating his plan for deliverance and redemption. I want you to know that today. In those times when we don't see or feel or hear from God, he is putting together deliverance and redemption. God heard the cry of the Israelites and God hears your cry. It's revealing to me that, Moses, that God knew who Moses was. He called him Moses. Moses. The very essence of a person in Hebrew culture is their name. And God knows your name. He has not forgotten you. He's committed to you. Isaiah 49, 16 says, I have engraved you in the palms of my hand. My hands. You're at the forefront of my mind and my heart in all that I am doing. When you cry out, God hears it. But his response may not be evident because he is taking your prayers and shaping them into a larger overarching plan that has many moving parts. Now, I was coming back from Ottawa on Tuesday, and, uh, and they were extending the LRT system closer to Perth. Okay, some of you are smiling. Um, now, when that's, when they, it wasn't like, uh, like, uh, Robin and, and uh, Ivan and Ed and a bunch of the guys said, hey, you know what, we want, we want the LRT to be closer. So we're going to get some shovels and some wheelbarrows and we're going to go out there and, and start getting ready for it. No. When I saw all those people there, I saw the cranes and the trucks and the, there, there was an architect and an engineer and an environmental guy, and there were, there were electricians, and there were cement guys, and there were asphalt guys. They were all working under the direction of an architect who designed that LRT system. And an architect of our lives is a loving, redeeming God who is in all and over all, and he's putting these moving parts together. He hears the cry of his people, and he hears your cry. Now, Moses himself was part of an overarching plan, an epic plan of love and covenant and redemption, and it had started 80 years earlier, as I read to you, when two midwives risked their lives, <laughs> and his parents, after three months, put him in the Nile in a basket, and that eventually led to all of Israel leaving Egypt. And while they are in the desert, one of the places that they take over is Jericho. And in Jericho, there's a prostitute who believed in God and became part of that group of people they took her, they saved her, and she married a, a Hebrew man. And th that couple became the line in which Jesus was born. Okay. This is the overarching plan that Moses is part of. And we are part of a plan ourselves. Wherever you are on that journey, God hears your cry. He's with you on that journey, and there is a bigger story. And I've gotten to know some of the stories of some of you. 
and some of the moving parts in your stories. And it's awesome and powerful to see how God is at work. Uh, on um, Tuesday night this week, uh, Sharon and I had the joy of, of entertaining uh, some friends we haven't seen in 40 years. When we were in Haiti, uh, a German couple came. They were in their mid-20s. They had four children between the ages of, I don't know, five and one. And they came to, to build a trade school in Haiti. But um, the, they, they, they ended up uh, uh, being uh, waylaid and he ended up being the mechanic in a garage. And w when we left uh, three or four years later, that's what they were doing. But while we were gone, an amazing thing happened. This guy, Detlef, happened to be in Port-au-Prince on business. He was staying at a guest house, and there was a guy in the guest house who, who said to him, what are you doing? And he said, well, my goal here is to build a trade school. And the guy said, what do you need? This guy was a, had a chain of uh, hardware stores in Illinois. And he said, anything you need, I will give you. I looked it up. It's still happening. This, this group of apostolic Christians from Illinois have supplied this trade school, which is now 500 students have graduated. And every morning before they pick up their hammers and saws, they gather together and they worship the living God, the, the beginner and the founder of their faith. So he waited four years. Some of you have waited longer. But, um, you know, we all have a journey, and when we look back, we can see how God has directed us. I can certainly look back, Sharon and I can look back and see his faithful uh, guidance and protection and provision. All our lives, he has been faithful. All our lives, he has been so, so good. Now, I want to close with these thoughts. When Moses saw the burning bush and he went to explore, God said, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Take off your sandals. Why did God instruct Moses to take off his sandals? Well, there is a tradition in the Middle East and in Asia, uh, places like Japan, and where it's, it's custom to take your shoes off at the door. You're not going to track in anything unsanitary into the house. And there's a tradition in Hinduism and Islam uh, that people take off their shoes to enter a sacred space. But I think there's something more happening here. God is represented to us as a burning fire that does not go out. It's a refining fire. And God does not want anything to come between him and the passionate, consuming love that God has for the world and that God has for his people. He wants intimate contact with us. This is the God who took on flesh and became a man, God with us. And he touched people, and people touched him. Outsiders, Magdalene, washed his feet with her tears. This is the God we serve. He is among us. He is moving among us. It's not out there or distant, he is present. And in an act of tender humility, Jesus himself took off the sandals of his disciples and washed their feet. And he instructed his disciples, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to take care of the physical and spiritual needs of this new church that's being birthed. So I, I want to just say this morning that 
God is involved intimately in your life. Not just spiritually, there's a physical connection. Take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. We sang this morning a Phil Wickham song that says, How I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets. To look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. And I thought about that and I thought, when we are in heaven, what clothes will we wear? Well, it says we'll, we will be robed in his robes of righteousness. But I think we will be barefoot on the holy ground of heaven. I'm going to invite the team up this morning. ask that you stand as we sing the song, I Stand in Awe.
uh, Moses didn't make it into the promised land. But before he died, the Lord told Moses how to bless the people. And this is the blessing for us today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Friends, go in peace. If you're inclined to join us this morning for some treats, there's fresh coffee and treats in the back room. Go with God's blessing.